just me, baby. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say what I do. I This show is called Conversations with Kelly, and I'm a woman on a hustle. I uh, actually started um, out being a baker. I have a cheesecake company called Cheesecakes by Kelly. Everything is always with a K. Just a little hook, and I just started off uh, trying to sell a cheesecake. Now I'm trying to sell this show. And um, the topics of this show... I picked primarily because it's of interest to me. And I figured if I found the people, the guests of interest, then there was someone else that would find them fascinating too. So it's everyday folks doing extraordinary things. My first guest is Mr. Craig Williams. He was on, I believe it was season five or season three of The Apprentice. He was the third finalist of Street Smarts and Book Smarts. He's Atlanta's own Mr. Craig Williams. I would like to introduce Mr. Craig Williams. He is gonna speak on his journey as an entrepreneur. Hopefully he will talk some dirt about Donald Trump and them, but he may not. But um, anyway, Craig Williams, please. Hello, Craig, how are you? Just fine, happy birthday to you as well. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. So tell us, tell us, you gotta do you, you know, I, I'm, I'm not scripted, so I might ask you some questions you don't wanna answer. That's what I wanna do, because okay. that's what I do. Ask you some questions you don't wanna answer? That's right. Y'all right. <laughs> know, y'all know how I am. Ask the questions, I'll give you an answer. No, tell us, tell us about you. Tell us, how did you get started? Craig Williams, uh, 41 years old, uh, father of four, beautiful daughters, and uh, husband of one. Husband of one? Yeah, so you, wife, yeah. yeah. Okay, husband of one, okay. One wife, one wife, one not one so of my daughters. no polygamy in your... No, no polygamy, okay. none right. of that. Okay. Yeah, get that clear. Um, right. Been married going on 15 years. Um, was conceived in Gainesville, Georgia, born in Gulfport, Mississippi, raised in San Francisco, and I'm back where I started. Been here 31 years. Okay. Um, love music, that was my first love. Uh, art, uh, just expressing myself through business most of my life, though. I've been an entrepreneur since the age of 16. Uh, in high school, I, I'm known for the candy man. I, I made a lot of money in candy. Uh, and it just evolved from there. I used my creative juices and uh, abilities to just uh, make people happy and enhance my surroundings and environment. So that's pretty much what I, I consider myself more of a supplement uh, to life or relationships or businesses or uh, individuals. Uh, so like a vitamin C. Nope. I know you started like in high school and I heard that you were like wearing suits in high school. <laughs> you know, you were like suit and tie. You were like really practicing being a businessman. How, um, how did you, how did you become, get, get on The Apprentice? Tell us about that. Start us with that. Well, we start with the, the first part of it and then get to that because yeah. that's a great divide there. Um, I guess um, I, I was raised with three sisters and a mom in San Francisco, and you know it's a different environment than the South. But uh, I was all my mom called me Craigie Man, so she dressed me up in suits and fedoras when I was little. So I was always the man in the house because my father passed a week before my fourth birthday. So I was you know Tupperware parties and fabric shops all my life, and uh, but I was the man of the house at a very young age, and so I always dressed that part. And it transferred into high school and gram well, grammar school and high school. I always wore suits and in high school I had a briefcase. That's where I used to keep my candy. And that's, you know, that, that uh, image, uh, what I wore pretty much became, that's who I was okay. until I matured to find out my true manhood. When did you decide that you wanted to just work for yourself? I've always worked for myself. Okay. And that's 
we'll get to that. That'd be a great caveat. But um, okay, you just do you, Craig. No, 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 no. I, I appreciate that. No, you that was said, good. That was I good. Just, I just uh, step away. You know. No, no. I'm, I'm trying no. to answer some questions. <laughs> and I'm answering. Them. Just, you just, I'm, go, you just go ahead. So, um, um, my first business. It wasn't after I got out of high school. My first business was really um, while I was in elementary school, and I used to cut out, you know, pieces of paper. If I needed a little extra money, I would make like figurines and the kids just like my creative side. So I would just cut out a piece of paper and make like Gilligan's Island. You remember back then there was one of those things, Gilligan's Island. So I'd make little figurines and they were three dimensional and I, and kids would buy it. So I would, you know, I made a business out of that or, you know, I drew pictures. They say, well, draw this or draw that. And I would do that. And I, 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 I realized at an early age that, I mean, if you're able to meet a need of someone, then you have, you have a business or you have an opportunity to create commerce. You went from candy to shoes to different things. It's always been service. Bottom line, it's always been service. So you just cater uh, around the service. I've talked to a number of the young ladies here and they're into interior design. Mm -hmm. uh, that's more of a service. It's not that they were creating, always creating the, the, um, the furniture or the decor. Uh, but they were putting it together. So I, I, I definitely know in this day and age, since a lot of things have been outsourced and are being outsourced, the manufacturing and, and what have you, the only thing that probably can't be outsourced here is that hands-on service with individuals. So I definitely believe that that is the future of America, not just young America, but of America, that we're going to have to coin that, that, uh, that service. Uh, I mean, here we're in a wine uh, restaurant. It's about how the atmosphere, but how they serve you, uh, and it's the presentation. It's it's more of the hands-on marketing of what we've taken for granted. Where we used to go to a liquor store to get our wine or whatever, you know, you go to an environment that uh, you're being served. And I mean, Nordstrom's has really done a real good job with that as well. Do any of your daughters have any entrepreneurial spirit in them? Are they doing the lemonade stands and all? Uh, no, nah, we're past the lemonade stands. I'm, I'm I'm steering them more to like water treatment things that we need. Uh -huh. Okay. You know, that type of uh, business, uh, looking a, a little bit ahead. I'm more of a chess player in that sense. And, and, and really wanting them to understand the fundamentals of, of business, of the, you know, uh, of, of commerce and service. And being a serial entrepreneur, that means you're kind of doing a, a bunch of different things. Is that A correct? bunch of different oh, things with different, different people, things. but I do okay. the same thing, really. And it goes back to what I said earlier. Uh, I consider myself a supplement. So I'm, you know, like... I enhance things. So I, I come into something that's already in motion or wanting to get to the next level and I make it better. And I, I help launch it. Um, a lot of us just need help uh, at different stages of our business or ideas, even relationships. You just need somebody on the outside that can look from a, a, an a, a objective and subjective uh, viewpoint and say, hey, have you looked at it from that perspective? And also somebody that will hold you accountable. We had lunch together a couple of weeks ago, and I asked him about Amarosa. Okay? Amarosa? Amarosa. get that right. <laughs> Amarosa. And he says that she's not nearly as bad as we... Uh, I said she was good people. You hear that, Amarosa? I said you were good people. Yeah. Because he's scared of her. That ain't no. what really said, y'all. He's just scared of her. I respect but, my sister. Okay. So, uh, and she was not on that particular... Uh, she was on the first season. She, she was, was actually on, on season season one. I was on season three. Right, okay. So, But she's just hung in there, though, hasn't she? She's yeah, she's found her niche, and yeah. she's working it. Okay, so tell us about um, Donald Trump and that whole... How did you get involved in The Apprentice? Well, um, The Apprentice was... Uh, I consider it a life-changing distraction. Um, and I would do it over again. It was, it was a lot of fun. It was an experience you couldn't buy. Um, it was an idea, I, once again, an idea that I had thought about. Uh, I, I was a big uh, uh, Survivor fan, and uh, Mark Burnett and the way he came out with this reality show, and it wasn't that I wanted to be on TV, but it was like, hey, I've, I've been surviving all my life. I beat the odds, you know. Um, I tell people a lot, I mean, as far as being a, the only male in an environment that you know, very feminized environment, you know, even where I lived in um, San Francisco and back in the 60s and the 70s. You know, it's, it's a different environment. And uh, I've beat the odds with, when it comes to a lot of my friends who are not on six, six, six feet underground are either behind bars, you know, the, the groups that I grew up in. And um, 
I beat the odds there. And in corporate America, I beat the odds there. And, and in the business world, in a lot of times, uh, even as far as one of my babies, Peaceful Feet uh, Shoe Shine. It's a shoe shine uh, concept uh, that I started on in 94 and uh, was first first shoe shine entity on the exchange. I made history with that business. Uh, Peaceful Feet Shoe Shine. Dot com. Um, it, it, it's, um, it was something that I'd lived, and I said, oh, I, could, I could do that, but I'm not one of those people who would just point at something and say, I could do that, or, oh, they should do it like this. I would, uh, um, if I say that I'm, I could do something, I would at least ply myself to get the opportunity to do it, uh, and not sit, by, sit back and say, woulda, coulda, shoulda. I don't want to have any regrets in my life. As far as Mr. Trump, uh, as long as the cameras were, were off, he was cool. I mean, he was real people. Had a good sense of humor, uh, could laugh at himself. It seemed as though he loved people. Uh, he was very op opportunistic, but also allowed to, uh, other people to have that opportunity uh, at a shot at things. That, he is generally a nice person. Generally, yeah, he is a, a nice guy. And uh, but when the uh, cameras come on, he has to be has that to person be hard, that everybody person. has known him to be. That persona. He has to put on that persona, and it's like a mask. You know, it's kind of like. And then he goes into that mode, and you know, mm, sometimes time. I feel sorry for him in a sense because it could be like a prison. You have to, you're, you're locked in. You can't be yourself, you know, all the time. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's all. That's all he is, you know. So, and when I did my my um, week of press, people were quoting me that because I had said earlier that I thought we were kindred spirits, and they would always ask me that part, whether I was on the Donny Deutsch show or the Today Show or whatever. They say, what was that about? You know, and it was, it was about the genuine, to, to see outside of what the possibilities could be. You know, of course, he came uh, a little bit more privileged, uh, well, excuse me, a lot more privileged <laughs> than I. Uh, the odds weren't against him, you know. Uh, it's not to say I'm not taking anything away from him. I respect him as a business person. But um, it was, you know, he had a, a, a lot to work with, whereas, you know, I didn't. Well, I disagree with you on that because I think God has really blessed you. I think you had a whole lot to work with. Oh, yeah, I definitely you appreciate know? that now. I, I that think I, you may yeah. have actually had more to work with than uh, Mr. Trump. Mr. Bernard Coleman, attorney Bernard Coleman, Harvard-educated Bernard Coleman. He is a partner of Morris, Manning, and Martin. Uh, Bernard Coleman is just wonderful. You had to score really, really high on the SATs to get into Harvard. How many choices did you have? Well, I played football, so, so I wasn't in the normal kind of application process. I was a I was a pretty good football player. I don't think I, I was a fullback, and 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 I actually um like I ran for about over a thousand yards and scored fourteen touchdowns, and and was doing my thing in in, in the high school uh, in high school athletics. So I really didn't have to go through the process of you know filling out a lot of applications and sending applications to colleges um, like I guess the normal high school student would have to do. I was more in the category of those football players who had schools recruiting them and. And, you know, in, in, in February, there was a national signing date where you went to sign. Um, my story was, was is really interesting because things were a little different for me. Um, I was being recruited by a lot of the big schools to come play football. But my high school football coach, he, because of my, my grade point average, I actually ended up graduating valedictorian of my high school class. But because of my football ability and the, the um, academics, um, that I that I the academic record that I had, he wanted me to go to somewhere that was much more of a academically oriented school. He decided was it Bernard, you know, if you want to go to to an Ivy League, let's look at the best. And some would, some might dispute it, but uh, it is what it is, and that's Harvard. Well, I played football my first year and actually got injured and tore up. Uh, my knee really bad and mm -hmm. and against Yale in New Haven, Connecticut. I, I'm from Connecticut, so and I'm, I'm well aware of the Harvard Yale, yeah, the Harvard -Yale rivalry. Yeah. So, um, last two minutes of the last game, 
um, I, I ended up uh, getting injured and actually ended up having knee surgery and missed a couple months of school. And I spent most of my first year and a lot of my college career on crutches and rehab and mm. and just trying to be able to walk normally. In a way, it was probably good that it happened in your first year because your your focus uh, switched. You weren't so concentrating on getting in the NFL then, right? Well, well I was still you know, concentrating on academics <laughs> okay. at the same time as playing football. Okay. But um, it, it, it was it, it was a, a blessing in disguise in, 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 a, in a few on a few fronts one it allowed me to <clears throat> excuse me it, it actually gave me the 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 uh, gave me the freedom to actually study abroad in my junior year um I would have never studied abroad if I was playing football and you went to Egypt yes I studied at the American University in Cairo so I got a chance to to travel all around the Middle East and um, experience that culture that's one blessing um, the other I think the other blessing is that it really gave me a certain confidence. And when I say confidence, meaning it was th th those were some very, very dark days for me. I mean, if you can imagine a 17-year-old kid coming from South Florida, going up to Boston, Massachusetts, Cambridge, Massachusetts, where Harvard is, being all alone, first time I was away from my, my family, and you know, having to undergo, I, I, I actually had two knee surgeries. Um, it was extremely painful. The rehabilitation process was extremely long and painful. And I still had school. When did you decide that you were going to be a lawyer? I think it was from around my sophomore, junior year when I decided to pursue law school. Okay, and working in the public defender's office, I guess that told you you didn't want to be a criminal yeah, attorney. Right. right. They didn't make any. They didn't, they didn't make enough money, unfortunately. Well, they're, they're passionate, though, aren't they? Yeah. They, it was, do they get a little jaded experience. after a while? I think a lot of people. I think the public defender's office and the prosecutor's office. Sometimes those offices can be stepping stones for a political career. I think, mm -hmm. and, and also can prepare you for, for of course, for going into private practice. Was Morris Manning the first law firm you worked for? No, actually, I started out in Atlanta working with a, a large law firm called Troutman Sanders. I worked there for a year and a half, and after that, transitioned to a, a smaller firm at the time called Minkin and Snyder, which uh, right before I left, uh, after, right after I left, they ended up merging with Greenbrook Traurig um, and came over to Morris Manning and Martin, and I've been with Morris Manning ever since. Why you being a partner at Morris Manning and Martin so significant? Well, in terms of time, it took I think approximately seven years uh, to become a partner um, with this firm. And um, in terms of the significance, you know, becoming a partner in a firm, when you're a, an associate, that's the dream. You know, that's the top. That's, that's the top in terms of being an associate in a, in a, in a, in a law firm. Um, in terms of its significance, I think part of its significance also goes to the dearth of African American partners in large law firms in not only Atlanta but but in the country, and you know I didn't have a whole lot of role models that I that I knew to follow, and here you know I was actually one of the first I think I was the first African American associate to actually go from being an associate to becoming a partner in, 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 in this firm. And just around the country and, and around the city, there's not a lot of uh, corporate attorneys who have the kind of transactional practice um, that I have a big law firm experience as partners in, in law firms here in, in the city. Just probably you can count them on two hands. So you are a little known black history fact. Isn't that <laughs> something? Tell me, um, I know that you you're married, right? Yes. And you have four beautiful children. Yes, four. Okay, so it must be challenging being married, being a partner mm -hmm. in one of the largest law firms in the city, mm -hmm. and being a husband and a father. Mm -hmm. How do you balance all that? It's hard, and I probably don't balance them in the way that I may want and 
the way that that we might that might be ideal. I think there are different philosophies in terms of you know balancing work and family, and but what I what in terms of my practice and in terms of the trials and tribulations and what it took for me to get here, it took a tremendous amount of sacrifice. And it's a sacrifice that your your spouse has to be willing to make. It's a certain selflessness that your spouse has to have for um, their significant other to actually become a partner in a law firm or become the president of the United States with Barack Obama and his, his wife. This is tremendous sacrifice. This man is from my home state. And this man is a little dynamo. When I tell you, y'all know him, y'all see him. He he is not the representative of my district, but I wish he was. State Senator Vincent Ford. Why is the 39th district the only district that can mm -hmm. benefit from Vincent Ford. Well, Why you, not well, all of Georgia, right? Well, now? you know, and even... And I think we need you. Even, the, the, even the things that we do, for example, the children who we're helping who are victimized in child prostitution are not only young Georgia, people in my right. district. They're, they're not only over. young people from Atlanta. They come from all over the state. Right. And uh, many of the senior citizens that I've helped have been throughout the region, you know, stopping foreclosures. But... You know, if the opportunity comes for me to serve in a, another way, I will take advantage of that opportunity. But for right now, uh, what I want to do is do as much as I can where I am to help people. But I'm, I'm always looking for opportunities to serve in any way that I can. What got you to Georgia? Well, I was born and raised in Connecticut, and, uh, but, uh, and I got my undergraduate education in Connecticut. But I came down here to get my advanced degree, my master's degree in, uh, in history at Atlanta University. Mm -hmm. Atlanta University is my alma mater. Mm -hmm. So I came down here to get an education and became involved in the community and then into politics. So, uh, you know, uh, there are many ways to serve, you know, and I, I've served in the classroom educating young people. I've served in you, the you, neighborhoods. You taught at Morehouse, is Yes, that? I'm Morehouse and Morris Brown and other historically black colleges and universities, so I've served in that way. I meet, I meet my students, my former students, almost every day. Oh, I see them, you know, and uh, almost always they're doing very, very well mm -hmm. and uh, make me very proud very of proud, them. I'm sure. My son uh, is going to Morehouse Get out of here. Good for him. Yeah. Good for him. So I've served in the classroom. I've served in the community uh, in an unelected capacity on many issues. Um, you know, of neighborhood protection and preservation. And I've also, uh, uh, so I, there are many ways to serve, and that's one thing that uh, I tell young people, there are many ways to serve, in addition to elected office. And, uh, but I've enjoyed my time in the state Senate. It's the only thing I've ever run for. I was successful in 1996 and been here for 12 years and will be here for just a little while longer so that we can try to accomplish some of the things that I talked about. What were your dreams? What did you want to be as a little boy? What did I want to be as a little boy? Yeah. Mm, that's a good question. What I wanted to be as a little boy, I wanted, uh, I know I wanted to teach. I know I wanted more so than any specific uh, uh, avocation. Uh, I knew that I wanted to be involved and make uh, things better. Make a difference. You know, that I, I knew I wanted to serve. Mm -hmm. And um, I was greatly affected by uh, the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. and um, you know, and whether it was Dr. King uh, and other icons, mm -hmm. who's uh, who sacrificed. So I knew, as opposed to a specific avocation, whether it was teaching or law or whatever, I knew I wanted to serve in whatever capacity uh, I was going to be in, I knew I would want to serve and use the knowledge and information that I had you know, in order to make things better. So I would say to you that it's, I, I didn't, you know, it's, it's really more, more important than what I wanted to be, quote unquote, when I grew up was how could I, whatever capacity I was in, it was incumbent upon me to be able to serve the community. You know, the civil rights movement is really kind of the, you know, you know the critical event, the critical 
um, event. And, you know, I grew up in a union household. My daddy was a member of a union. My mother was a member of a union. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, the two things I think that affected me more than anything else was that I came from a family who understood that uh, coming together as uh, in unity, uh, whether it was workers or African Americans, was absolutely necessary in order to make the world a better place. And then two, um, the civil rights movement. So the union movement and the civil rights movement really kind of uh, developed, you know, my persona and my, how I looked at the world, the vision mm -hmm. that I have or had. So. Um, that's kind of more important than anything else, those kinds of, you know, being in a setting where those things were held in high esteem. What's the next, the mm -hmm. next hot issue you're going to handle when the legislation... Um, the legislature convenes. Uh, probably the one that I probably will devote more time and energy to than anything else is raising the mandatory school attendance age. You know, I introduced that bill this past session, and I was told that it cost too much. They said it would cost $23 million. I don't think it would cost that much. But even if it did, you know, the question is not how much is it going to cost us to do it. How much, how much is it going to cost us if we don't, don't do, do it. it? We know very quickly 6,600 students, young people, will show up in 11th grade that would not otherwise have showed up if we passed this law. Absolutely requiring 17-year-olds to be in school, 6,600. What we know is that 60% of those young people will end up in jail. The parents should, you know, mm -hmm. you're 16 in my house, so you can't quit school, you're mm -hmm. 16. I well, don't care what the law says, I'm telling you what I say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Some of that responsibility lies With the in parents. the parents. Oh, yeah, definitely. And one of the things that we have done, you know, that I have not agreed with my Republican colleagues on almost anything uh, down here, but uh, I did agree that we needed to have graduation coaches. Um, when you have people who are at, young people who are at risk for dropping out, you need someone mm -hmm. to what, talk with them. And then two, it's not a matter of sending home the paperwork to the parents to mm -hmm. see if they'll sign it for them to yeah. leave school. That parent must have what? Counseling. Absolutely. You know, what I, happened to the day when we would, mm -hmm. the teachers would call the parents, would talk mm -hmm. to the parents? Well, see, the thing is, you know, things have changed. They can go to quote unquote work, but the fact of the matter is, the 16 year age for dropping out is, an, is something from yeah. the time when you could uh, find a job, and find a job, a job or education. go work in the fields. There ain't Absolutely. that many fields to go to work in anymore, and ain't that many jobs. And have they shipped you, our fields overseas, too? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and the, what they have, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, after, between the 1930s and 1970s and 80s, you could, you know, you didn't, you could work in a, in a factory job, raise a family, and send your kids to college, college right. but those jobs are going where? Yeah, they're going. They're going overseas. Yeah, they're they're being outsourced. Now, I did not tell you. I, all three of these men, the men that you wish you met at the club but didn't, I know. I love them all. And I'm so mad that none of them are mine. Thank you for joining us. And I hope that we see you again soon.